The, the left has this crazy idea that society shapes people uh, and, and oppresses them. The fact of the matter is society reflects who people are. The real problem is us. Uh, the same people who cause all the misery in the world are going to be the people who lead your revolution. Mainstream media gives you the impression that there is nothing good about America. In direct contrast to that, my podcasts will prove by examples that America has always been and still is the land of opportunity for everyone. Welcome to another episode in the series Life Lessons with Dr. Bob. My guest today is David Horowitz, an exceptionally talented, intelligent, insightful, and serious man who just celebrated his 84th birthday and is still fighting vigorously to preserve the freedoms which we have all enjoyed in America. I always begin my interviews by giving the background of my guest. It typically includes my guest's educational background, positions held, and major accomplishments. And it usually takes just a few minutes. But David's background is more interesting and far more complex than any other guests that I've interviewed. So I've decided to spend more time on the introduction. His story is complex because there are two David Horowitzes. There's the young David Horowitz who was born in 1939 at the end of the Great Depression to Phil and Blanche Horowitz, both high school teachers. Now that's not so unusual so far, but what is unusual is that his parents were both long-standing members of the American Communist Party and strong supporters of Joseph Stalin. David Horowitz was a red diaper baby. Growing up, his Stalinist parents didn't allow him or his sister to watch popular Dara's Day and Rock Hudson movies. Instead, they were forced to watch propaganda films from the Soviet Union. The second day of our Horowitz is the one who is with me today. He's the author of more than 50 books, most of them highly critical of the left that he grew up with. Some of his most popular books are, first, his autobiography, Radical Son, A Generational Odyssey. Another is Unholy Alliance, Radical Islam in the American Left. The Shadow Party, how George Soros, Hillary Clinton, and 60s radicals seized control of the Democratic Party. The Enemy Within, how a totalitarian movement is destroying America, and more recently, a book entitled I Can't Breathe, How a Racial Hoax is Killing America. In addition to becoming a prolific author, David is the founder and president of the David Horowitz Freedom Center, an organization that he founded with Peter Collier, another former radical leftist, in 1988. The mission of the center is defend, to defend free societies from enemies that attack the moral, cultural, and economic foundations that have made those free societies so successful. These days, the enemies that he's referring to are the so-called progressives and Islamists. Through our discussion today, you'll learn how David made the 180-degree political transition from being a, a 60s radical leftist to become the most articulate spokesman for the conservative movement today. David, welcome to the show. Thank you, and thank you for that generous introduction. Let's start with your transition. No, not from a woman to a man, as, the, uh, the, as is usually referred to these days, but your transition from being a left-wing radical to being an articulate proponent of the conservative cause. What caused that radical change? Well, I was one of the founders of the New Left, and the New Left really was about preserving the communist goal but escaping from the all, all the crimes uh, and, and bad press that the communist movement had gotten to that point. 
And I, I edited the, I worked for Bertrand Russell for a while. And then I came back to America and edited uh, Ramparts, the largest magazine of the new left. Um, as the editor of Ramparts, I, I got known to radicals. And uh, right. one of them was a Hollywood producer named Bert Schneider, who's no longer with us. Um, his father was the head of Columbia Pictures. Uh, and he was the chief sponsor of the Black Panther Party. <clears throat> and he persuaded me to meet with Huey Newton, who was the leader of the Black Panther Party. Um, and I was, I actually couldn't refuse it because I was looking for money for, I, I wouldn't have refused it anyway, because I bought a lot of our mythology that the Panthers were uh, persecuted by the police. In fact, they were a murderous gang that I eventually found out murdered a dozen people, most of them black, except for my friend. Um, I raised a lot of money. Uh, I think it was about $160,000 and bought a Baptist church in East Oakland that had been over, it was all white church and had been overtaken by the ghetto. Um, it was the biggest check I ever signed uh, buying this um, this church in uh, East Oakland. It had 35 classrooms and a theater. Um, and I, I set up a board, I called it the uh, Oakland Community Learning Center. And I set up a board um, composed of Panthers and myself to operate it. And uh, I remember the exact dates. I believe it was December 1974. Um, well, first of all, the Panthers were unable to find a a real bookkeeper. And I believed that the state was so repressive it would shut them down if they weren't squeaky clean. So I recruited my bookkeeper at Ramparts to do the books of the school. And in December 1974, she disappeared. She was last seen leaving a local bar with a black man. Uh, by the time the police fished her body out of San Francisco Bay, I knew the Panthers had killed her because I was interviewed by the police and they explained to me the difficulty if you don't have an organization of disposing of a body and so forth. And uh, I stopped sort of going around the Oakland Community Learning Center after that, I was pretty frightened for myself, but mainly for my children. I had four children. And one Jason. second, do, do you think that uh, uh, she was killed because she uncovered uh, uh, the uh, uh, thefts of money or? Uh, yeah, they were, they were, they were, for, they were dealing drugs um, and, uh, you know, extorting local businessmen, getting them to contribute to this learning center that I had created. <laughs> that I had created. The Panthers had it. There were several hundred of them, and they uh, Huey had pulled them all back from various cities in the United States, and and they had a lot of children, and they needed a school, but there was also drug dealing at the school. Um, and I, I've actually written about all this in Radical Sun in detail, so I probably shouldn't go on with it. But that that was such a crushing experience. Betty Van Patter, who was the name of the woman, had three children. The youngest was about 18 and had, had been working for me at Ramparts along with Betty. Betty didn't trust me. Um, probably because she was less critical of the left 
than I was. At the time, I had certain criticisms already, but this was a shattering experience. I was clinically depressed for about seven or eight years, uh, during which time I will, will try to get back on my feet. Uh, I had no motivation to do anything, so I latched on to Peter Collier, and we um, wrote several articles jointly, uh, including a history of the weather, the weather underground. So you um, said there were other things that uh, caused you to uh, uh, to question the left um, uh, besides. Uh, well, yeah, a because killed. this coincided. Mm -hmm. Betty washed up in February. And in April, the United States was forced to leave Vietnam to the communists because of the political pressure of the left. And what the communists proceeded, we had always said we're an anti-war movement, we're for the self-determination. I knew the communists were bad by then. Anyway, I was a reader, so I read a lot of Trotsky his history of the Russian Revolution. I, I knew about the crimes of Stalin. Um, I, I, I wasn't a mindless um, Marxist, shall we say. Uh, and, and so I had a, a certain distance already. But when the left, when the communists proceeded to slaughter two and a half million in no Chinese peasants. And there was not a single demonstration by the left. I knew that our whole movement was based on lies and we were criminals. And basically we're evil, the left is an evil movement. Uh, anyway, that was the end of my life in the left. Okay, so continuing on, uh, you realized time, Peter just Peter Collier and I had written a bestseller on the Rockefellers, um, New York Times bestseller, and we had gone on to sign up for a Kennedy book, and uh, I did all the interviews, and Peter did most of the writing on the Kennedy book, um, and it was a number one bestseller. New York Times bestseller. Um, and somebody from the Washington Post called us or called me to pick my brain about Joe Kennedy Jr., who was a congressman. And, uh, I, you know, I'm sort of irrepressible. I have loose lips. So I said, you won't believe this, but Peter and I just voted for Ronald Reagan. <laughs> And he said, oh, that's a good story. And <clears throat> it appeared on the cover of the Sun, uh, Sunday, Washington Post Sunday magazine. So basically, officially, you became a conservative by saying that lefties I voted for Ronald Reagan. Was called, they called it Lefties for Reagan. Our title was Better Ron Than Red. That's a, but, that's fantastic, David. And in addition, I think you coined, you coined the saying... Uh, inside every progressive is a totalitarian, a totalitarian screaming to get out. Yeah, that's from direct experience. That's expand the whole on that. Expand on that. First of all, the term progressive, as I understand it, was coined um, during maybe it was the 40s or 50s by communists who knew that uh, that Americans. Uh, were were anti-communist, so they couldn't use the term communist, so they just used the term we're progressive. Is that is that your understanding of the term oh, progressive? Oh, my parents term? were progressives. I never heard the word uh, communist as a self-description. It was always progressive. Right. And the progressive party was 100% controlled by the Communist Party, the one that ran Henry Wallace for president in 1948. Yeah. Um, if you're a radical, you want to change the world. Uh, you know, if you're a reasonable person, you understand that the world can't be changed too quickly or too completely. Uh, our institution is, the, the left has this crazy idea that society shapes people. 
uh, and, and oppresses them. The fact of the matter is society reflects who people are. The real problem is us. Uh, the same people who cause all the misery in the world are going to be the people who, who lead your revolution. They have the same, well, you can just see with the, the Democrat Party, uh, as I show chapter and verse in this book, but anybody with two eyes and, uh, and a clear mind can see, it, it's pathological liars, all the Democrat leaders, starting with Joe Biden. I mean, he can't, when he tells the truth, it's, 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 an, it's an anomaly. It's, right. It's so you know, you are unique, David, because of your active participation and even your leadership in the past of leftist causes, you understand better than anyone else the evil intent and goals of the left. That's that's let's, what I let, my let's, mission was when I right. joined the right, because the right was calling the Republicans. They're all referring to the de the Democrats were referring to them as racist, white supremacists, uh, tra tra traitors, and the Republicans were calling the Democrats liberals. They're vindictive bigots. Exactly. You call them. Exactly. And, and whenever I speak to people on the right, I tell them, don't refer to the left as liberals, because liberal has a positive connotation to it. Uh, what yeah, we should liberal. refer to the left as yeah, are leftists or socialists or communists. Society. That's what they are. I, anyway, I, when I came over to the right, I didn't want to duplicate what other people were doing well. Uh, but I did want conservatives to understand how sinister the left is. That was Ex my revelation. Exactly. Now, and you had revelations way before, or insights, way before anyone else. Let's talk about reparations, of course, for slavery. You know, you recognized in 2001, you wrote a column, I think it was in Salon Magazine, where you described your opposition to reparation yeah calling it racism against blacks. Now, yeah. how was, I, I want you to describe how giving money to blacks is racism against blacks. Well, what I, I was the title of it was 10 reasons why reparations are racist. Uh, I forget the other and racist too. Wh whatever, I can't remember the title of the piece I wrote. Um, first of all, I, I, among these 10 reasons, the, the, the one that people attack the most, but the one that I think is the most important, is that if you actually know something about American history, Blacks have every reason to be grateful that they were shipped to America. They were enslaved by black Africans. Slavery existed in Africa for a thousand years before a white person ever set foot there. Every black in America who's descended from slaves is free because of the sacrifice, first of all, of the vision of a slave owner named Thomas Jefferson declaring that all men are created equal and have a God-given right to liberty. Um, and to the 360,000 mainly white Union soldiers who gave their lives to free the slaves. The, the bottom line is, and I, I've been attacked for this too, is that Blacks were enslaved by Blacks and freed by whites. White, there is no, no historical record known to me of one people one race of people sacrifice, making sacrifices like that for another. So American, white Americans, uh, you know, not, not unfortunately, well, not the children of actual segregationists in the South um, who have that mentality, but white Americans can be very proud of their history in treating black people.
So you are basically opposed to the thought of, uh, uh, of what's uh, of the theme of the 1619 project, where uh, um, uh, where yeah, America was Times, founded on racism, right? Attacks, Systemic racism. The attacks on the uh, on white people by the Democrat Party are attacks on the founding. Yes, they say that the the Constitution is a white supremacist document. We even have a Supreme Court justice, Katanji Jackson Brown, who is a critical race theorist, and that's the center of critical race theory. Um, They want to destroy the Constitution. That's what that's about. This is the attacks on white people. I mean, they're, they're ridiculous. To call Donald Trump a racist is ludicrous. Guy was a liberal for most of his life. Nobody ever referred to him as a white nationalist or white supremacist until he ran for president against the Democrats. That's that's when that started. Um, But these people hate America. That's the bottom line. The left wants to destroy. Well, look. What is the situation of blacks in America? 80% now live above the poverty line. They're they're basically in the functioning economy. Um, Black America is the richest, most privileged, freest black community in the world, including all of black Africa and the black West Indies. So it's out, it's outrageous. It's just racial extortion. What's going on in California offering people five million dollars if their skin is black? That that's that's worse in its way than the the Ku Klux Klaners. I mean, they just didn't want to mix with blacks. Uh, oh, it's just it's uh, unbelievable uh, what's gone on in our country. And, 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 and the publicity, uh, David, that in uh, the positive publicity that Black Lives Matter got and is still getting in some quarters is uh, quite surprising to me. I mean, uh, they were, uh, as far as, as I know, they, they were leaders of, uh, of the riots in the cities. Uh, that uh, in the black neighborhoods, which uh, which which cause more uh, uh, poverty and and suffering for the and for the blacks who live in that neighborhood, low level paranoid criminals, the leaders of Black Lives Matter, they, they're the kind of people who steal from the um, charity basket at, in churches on Sunday. Uh, they took all the money that was given for black people, <laughs> poor black people, and they bought mansions with it for themselves. How, how, you know, how sinister is that? We're, we're in very bad shape in this country, although I see positive developments. Um, Trump has created the first mass conservative movement in the history of the country with his rallies. When I came into the right 40 odd years ago, uh, I looked around, the first thing I said is, where's the ground army? Well, my comrades, ex-comrades on the left were busy. They had all these organizations. They harassed CEOs of companies. It was basically Jesse Jackson and Sharpton were extortionists. And they would go to companies and say, give us $4 million for our great cause, or we're going to boycott you as racist. Now, no CEO (laughs) wants to have a boycott from the leaders, thanks to white leftists of the Black community, uh, like Sharpton, a disgrace, a human disgrace, Sharpton. But he's a kingmaker in the Democrat Party. Next, I want to talk about uh, how observant and foretelling you were uh, as early as 1992. 
More than 30 years ago, David, you recognized the erosion of academic freedom in our universities. I wrote four books, five and, books. Yeah, let, which, let me get, and you published a monthly magazine at first that focused on political correctness in our colleges and universities. And in 2006, you published a book called The Professors, The 101 Most Dangerous Academics in America. That book profiled professors who indoctrinate students in leftism rather than educate them. You followed yes. that up in 2007 with another book, Indoctrination You, The Left's War Against Academic Freedom. Now, how did you recognize this issue 30 years before, 30 years, not a year because before, 30 years education. before anyone else did. How did you recognize that? It was easy. I had a great education at Columbia in the 50s, um, where I was exposed to all views. I mean, it was just liberating. I had professors who, whatever view you took, <laughs> they, they took the contrary view, and they were so much more knowledgeable than you were, and it, it taught me a lesson that you gotta have two sides to any any conversation. Um, and the, I spoke on 400 campuses, uh, although some of them were just sort of semi-riots. Left doesn't like to hear opposition, uh, but I spoke on 400 campuses. I would always go in and interview the conservative students. Like, I. I I, my last university I did this with was at Dartmouth not that long ago, maybe 10 years ago. And I asked the conservative kids um, if, the, if there was a course in, in the Cold War. And they said, yes, but it's taught by somebody who wants the Soviets to win. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. That tells you how bad it is, 60000 a year to get that. And and the left showed up at my lecture. It was nothing like a collegiate lecture because I had lesbians standing up on the seats, tongue kissing each other. I had leftists playing pornographic films on their computers and turning the sound way up. I had people making speeches from the audience and walking out. And the vice president of Dartmouth in charge of student affairs was there. He thought it was amusing. Mm -hmm. And that's how, that mm -hmm. I would never send my kid to Dartmouth. But no, I then, think uh, I wouldn't send my kid to any name in college Yale. these days. Yeah, it's true of all of them. Now, so what? what's the future? Is there any hope in stopping the leftist brain? Well, like I say, the Trump has created him. This has all happened because conservatives basically minded their own business and trusted the system. And they never engaged the left in the way the left was engaging them. Um, so the first lesson is fight back. I mean, it, it's, it's sort of slowly got, getting into the Republican leadership. Um, you know, the transformation of, well, we'll see if it's a full transformation of McCarthy as to, to get the speakership uh, is a very good sign. Um, we'll see what happens. The other is the grassroots movement among parents objecting to these horrific practices in the K-12 schools. You know, this is about creating the new man and the new women who'll be pliant to a totalitarian state, but castrating prepubescent kids um, for these non-scientific uh, gender theories. To call it gender affirmation when the gender is invented by, 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 is, a, is a choice of the of this student. It's horrifying what they're doing to kids in the schools. But it's called forth uh, a, a mass revolt. What happened in Virginia will happen elsewhere. I you know, David, uh, we're being deluged every day with a push for diversity, equity, and inclusion. DEI. Yeah, those are the races. DEI. One second. So that is, 
that, that's the communist, that, that's Chinese communism, brainwashing people. You hire these brain dead racists who think that the constitution is a white supremacist document, even though it doesn't mention the, the words oh. white and black don't appear in the constitution. You have these idiots in classrooms who have no business being near students, uh, and they force the faculties to attend their diversity so-called training sessions, where if you disagree with them, you're going to lose your job. You're going to be canceled. It's just terrible. This is, this is, we have an incipient fascist state in this country. That's the way the Biden administration is behaving. And it bothers me that I kind of am, I don't know of anybody else who's saying it, but it's so obvious. Look at what happened. I described this in my book on February, uh, January 6th. Um, there's an inspector general's report, which reports that they had a meeting in the White House and Trump offered to provide thousands of National Guards ahead of time. Guard. Yeah, ahead of time. On, on January 6th, because anybody with two eyes and half a brain knows that on both sides, there are people itching to create trouble. Me. Right now. So the Democrats denounced it as an armed insurrection. So the lie was too, too swift coming out of their mouths. And they were faced with the fact that no arms were confiscated from the people in the Capitol. Um, so they just kept the word insurrection. And they pretended that five Capitol police officers were killed. Hakeem Jeffries and Joe Biden has said that recently. The actual number of Capitol police officers killed is zero. Right. But they went further. It's, it's like the Potemkin village in the Soviet Union. They concocted uh, a martyr, Brian Sicknick. They said his head was bashed in by a fire extinguisher and he was killed on February, on January 6th. The fact is that he died the next day at home in his bed of natural causes. And he was an ardent Trump supporter. Trump supporter. That didn't prevent them from staging a mock funeral, well, at night, staging a funeral where he was given the honor of lying in state in the rotunda of the Capitol while these Democrat liars praised him, mourned him, and praised him for having died defending the Capitol against these unarmed protesters. It's insanity what happened. And Republicans sort of do what they normally do. They they lay down and let these people walk all over them. I, I mean, they should I want to talk about David. I, I want to talk about equity. Okay, equity. It's a new term. I want to make a point about innovative products from America, iPhone and Tesla, companies, innovative companies, Amazon and Microsoft have changed the world and raised the standard of living for everyone. American entrepreneurs that, inv that invent these innovative products and ways of doing business, they're successful because of their skill and knowledge and willingness to work hard and their willingness to take risk. Essentially, the success of each entrepreneur is due to his or her merit. They've earned that success. So describe the goals, if you will, of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and uh, predict how this is going to affect our merit-based system and negatively affect our oh, standard destroying. of living in America. Tell me it's about that. It's destroying it, but it's unconstitutional and illegal, and it's racist. The problem is there aren't enough voices exposing it as what it is, which is a racist it's really a re-education pro de programming of faculty in, in the schools. They do it in the medical schools. Uh, it's just, it's, it's, it's a nightmare. But there is a resistance. 
And if more people, I, I wish that some of the leaders in Congress of the Republican Party would use the word fascist. Look, they put Peter Navarro, a presidential advisor, who never committed a crime in his life, a businessman, um, who refused to cooperate with the fake uh, January 6th committee, refused to appear there by invoking executive privilege. There's some proper place where that has to be adjudicated. But instead of calling him up and calling him over uh, to wherever this place was, they waylaid him getting off a plane and put him in leg irons. And what is that about except to intimidate anybody who disagrees with them and to humiliate him? That's fascism. That's what that's about. Um, Ashley Babbitt is the only person killed on January 6th. She was murdered in cold blood. It's on videotape. She was standing, she's five foot tall, unarmed, an Air Force veteran, 40 years old. She's standing, you can see her on the video, standing among Capitol Police officers idly, not, not threatening anybody, not making any gesture that could be interpreted as a threat. And this Capitol Police officer named Michael Byrd killed her. He just killed her in cold blood. Nancy Pelosi hid his identity for a month or two, quashed the investigation, made him a free man, and gave him a medal for being a hero defending the Capitol. Technically, if that were, if that case were, were to actually go to trial, Nancy Pelosi would be indicted as an accomplice to murder. And that's really true of the whole January 6th committee. Yet Republicans are too polite to draw attention to this. But that shows the will in the Democrat Party to, have, to do criminal behavior, um, to, to establish a one-party state, which has been their goal for 30 or 40 years. You, you know, speaking of criminality, Biden's destruction of the borders is a criminal act. Biden is the head of the executive branch that it's tasked with enforcing the law, not making the law. That's for Congress to do. Congress didn't alter our immigration laws. Biden did illegally and unconstitutionally and with the support of the entire Democrat party. We are in dire straits in this guy. Let, let me tell you one, one other story. I'm amazed that I haven't seen this story anywhere but in my book. And in, but I got it from a book by two Washington Post reporters. On January 2nd, four days before the 6th, it happened to be the anniversary of Trump's killing of General Soleimani, the Iranian terrorist, who is responsible for every wounded warrior you see who's been maimed by an IED in uh, Iraq. Um, the Iranians issued a death threat to the president of the United States and said Trump will not only be removed from office, he had lost the rigged election of 2020, but he will be removed from life because we cannot forgive the killing of General Soleimani. So you would think that American security forces would rally around our president whose life was threatened by these mullahs. In fact, the chief in charge of presidential security is General Mark Milley, one of the geniuses who presided over the worst humiliation the country has ever suffered in war in Afghanistan. General Milley went around, and this is all reported by Washington Post reporters, went around to security meetings in the White House denouncing Trump as Hitler, hmm. saying his stop the steal speech was the gospel of the Fuhrer, 
and saying that his supporters were the guys we fought in World War II, they're Nazis. And he, all the security plans he had were to defend against Trump and his supporters, not the Iranians. That's treason in big, bold letters. Again, I mean, Anderson Cooper thought that this showed what a wise man Milley was, was mm -hmm. uh, to keep the military neutral. That's not neutrality. <laughs> when, you, when you call the president, you're supposed to be defending Hitler. Um, anyway, the hour is very late, but I'm, I'm impressed with people like Jim Jordan uh, and, and, and the voices in Congress that are finally speaking up and finally trying to pursue this. We have a criminal president who's a traitor. A anybody with two eyes. I mean, how can you not see that Biden didn't get $51 million for his UPenn office from the Chinese for nothing? What did he give back? If, if you look, I, I described the withdrawal from Afghanistan. And I, I put in the book, I said, I, I have no way to explain this except by the Chinese influence that the turning over Afghanistan to China and the Taliban. Uh, I don't think the Taliban can use the air bases, but the Chinese can, and the minerals. <laughs> um, why do I say that? You don't have to go to a military academy to know here we were there for 20 years and we encouraged Afghan women to defy the Taliban and go to school and enter sports and become equal. So all these women are exposed. Then there's all the people that supported us in Afghanistan. So the first thing you have an evacuation plan is you evacuate the potential hostages and victims of the Taliban when it takes over. They didn't do that. They withdrew the military. Doesn't make any sense. And, that, and there was one resignation and it shows you they're all in bed together. Anyway, that's why he's saying <clears throat> the next election could be the last. Let, let's, let's go into this. Uh, you know, there are many other topics I'd like to delve into and maybe we'll do a follow on. But you just published a book called Final Battle, The Next Election Could Be the Last. It's on the stands now. Uh, it's even at Costco and major retailers where it's, to my surprise, it's prominently displayed next to recent books by best-selling authors like Tom Clancy and John Grisham. So I'm happy that, that it's getting this kind of uh, uh, exposure. But why do you think 2024 is the final battle and that well, it could be our last free people election? People asked the wrong question about 2020, for example. <clears throat> Was it fixed or not, the 2020 election? Well, the answer is nobody, not only nobody knows, but nobody can know because there was no audit of the vote after the election. So nobody can say with certainty it was or was not fixed. The margin was tiny. There were 150 million, 59 million votes, and Biden won by 40,000. No, but but what you can certainly say, uh, uh, don't even think about the number of votes cast, or these were uh, paper ballots, uh, mail-in ballots that could have been uh, falsified, whatever, and there's all sorts of uh, claims about that. But without that... If you just think about four years of negative propaganda against oh, Donald the Trump, uh, that Biden, had to affect Biden. people's voting patterns and that there was zero, zero uh, disclosure of Biden or his son, uh, uh, what they did in, in whether it was Ukraine or China, zero disclosure about that. So here you he, had an uh, unbalanced field where agree. all of the all of the publications were we against agree. Trump for four years. So that in itself is, is a manipulation of the uh, of the entire election. We agree on that, but it's an opinion. 
I, all I'm saying is nobody can know with certainty because there was no audit of the votes. Trump filed 61 lawsuits, which had lots of evidence in them, but they were never heard. They were dismissed on procedural grounds. What we do know is the Democrat Party undertook a massive campaign to rig the election, to make it easy to cheat. You don't undertake a campaign and make it easy to cheat unless you intend to cheat. Um, in July of 2020, the Democrats sent out a task force consisting of 600 lawyers and 10,000 volunteers. So all the battleground and then other states as well to change the election laws illegally. In Pennsylvania, for example, the Constitution stipulates that the election laws are, are to be set by the state legislatures. In Pennsylvania, the, the election rules were changed by the state Supreme Court, which the Democrats went to because they control the state Supreme Court. So we know the intention of the Democrats was to cheat. Um, there was, if you recall, a very controversial election in 2000 between Bush and Gore in Florida with a lot of irregularities so that the Supreme Court had to decide the election. Um, James Baker, Bush's chief of staff, and Jimmy Carter, a Democrat pre former president, formed a bipartisan commission called the Carter-Baker Commission on Election Reform. And they made a series of recommendations as to how to make it, to, to protect the integrity of the voting system. Number one, increase the reg regulations requiring voter ID. Number two, don't use unsolicited paper ballots because they're easy to cheat with. No ballot harvesting, no ballot boxes. Um, I, anyway, I, I listed them in, in the book. Every one of those is the <laughs> was the Democrat objective in, in reform, uh, reversing every one of those. And everybody knows it because their biggest campaign was against voter ID, which they called Jim Crow II, I mean, they, they just can't resist playing the race card at every turn. The reality is that minorities are voting in record numbers. There is no voter suppression. Why would you single out voter ID and, and eliminate it and send out 90 million paper ballots uh, into the, you know, it's, you're sending it to people who are dead. You're just sending it out to the voter rolls that you haven't purged. Why would you do that unless you were trying to rig the election? Yes. Now, so and, uh, given all so that, much, what are your what uh, what are your predictions, David, for 2024? Who do you think uh, the nominees will be? Well, I I actually think it'll be Trump, and God forbid Michelle Obama. Yes. I I I agree with you. And I think that uh it's a shoe in and that's why Michelle is going to be chosen as the nominee and I, uh, I disagree. Oh, I think Americans are fed up with black racists. Yeah, but she won't. Oh, she's not going to position herself that way in the media. She's going to, David, she's she going to position herself as I'm not a politician. My husband was the part. We've had enough politicians on the left or the right. That's what she's going to do. She's yeah. going to come across as I'm going to use my female judgment. Her, her country until her husband became president. Look, it's all up to the Republicans. It's how you fight the battle. If they're going to treat her with kid gloves, 
You're right. Yeah, but I, I don't think you can treat her any other way. Uh, she has no experience. There's no track record. That's You yeah. can say that that's no, that, that's that you can point that out. But... Oh, you can say this is a wonderful woman, but it's an insult to the American public. She has no experience. Well, her husband had no experience either, David. I understand that, but we were through. And he won. Yeah, I think you're assuming the American public is smarter now. It's no smarter. People. It's no smarter than it was. It's the same people. In Look the same at all the Hispanics who, who who have been elected to Republican seats. Yes, it's a good move. It's wonderful to see that. Look at all the blacks that are on the Republican side. Yes. Uh, people change. People, you know, they see what we've been through. They see this administration saying everything's all right, the border's secure. The, the number of crimes that this influx of nearly 5 million illegals uh, will create is monstrously large. Right. Intentional. In intentional. In, not, not potentially. No, no, I uh, said intentional. Oh, intentional crime. <laughs> In 2018, this is on page 70 of my book, the Government Accounting Office did a study of illegal so-called migrants, invaders, in American prisons and jails. The number, 730,000. They had been arrested 4.9 million times. That's catch and release at work. Mm. They committed seven and a half million crimes, seven and a half million. And now we, we I don't know what the numbers are, but they're probably five to 10 times greater of, of illegals coming in. Um, a million drug crimes, 500,000 assaults, 134,000 sexual assaults, 51,000 kidnappings, and uh, I, I forget some of the others, and 1,500 terrorist attacks. You can't have an open border and not um, inherit enormous trouble. And then, unfortunately, innocent people. Why are Hispanics on the border opposed to the Biden policies and wanting a secure border because they're the first prey. So I, I, I think the times ahead are ugly, going to be ugly, but I don't think people are going to stay in the same complacency, complacent position they've been in. How long are these cities that the Democrats have run for 50 to 100 years, how long are they going to tolerate this rampant crime wave. Well, all these are... Uh... Look at Elon Musk. He's a left-of-center guy, and, he, and he's doing wonders for the country. Um, not everybody, you know, people change their minds. Yes, but, but even if they do... Um... Uh, look what happened in the in the past uh, in the 2020 election. Uh, all the questions about its accuracy or lack of accuracy. You don't think that's going to happen again? They're going to do it of again. Course, but who's going to look? The Democrats, the lies they tell are so transparent. They said it was the fairest election ever. That's an obvious lie. How would they? How would they know? But you know, uh, as I was it uh, a fame, I forget which communist said, it doesn't matter who votes. What matters is who counts the votes. And um, well, that's true. And the Republicans haven't paid attention. You know, George right. Soros got involved in electing the secretaries of the state a decade ago or more. I actually did a book with uh, Richard Poe called The Shadow Party How Hillary, how Soros and Hillary. And the left, the radical left, took over the Democrat Party. Yes, it's true. It's true. David, I want to close with thanking you for spending time with me today, but thank you so much more for your past and your continuing efforts to educate the American public about uh, the significant threats to our culture 
into our country from the far left. Uh, it's just my hope that uh, people will wake up and uh, vote accordingly. Thanks again. Thank you, Bob. It's been a pleasure. And I, I don't really know how to do anything else. <laughs> well, you do it well, David. And thank you for watching. And if you enjoyed this episode of Life Lessons with Dr. Bob, please subscribe and you'll be automatically notified of future podcasts in the series. Thanks so much for listening to another episode of Life Lessons with Dr. Bob. If you enjoyed these interviews with some of today's most influential thought leaders, please follow and rate the show on your favorite podcast platform. And don't forget, you can also watch each episode on YouTube as well. We'll see you next time. Hey, thanks for tuning in. I appreciate reading your comments on YouTube and social media. And now you can submit your questions on my website as well. Head over to lifelessonswithdrbob.com and click the question tab at the top of the page or the one on the right side of the screen and let us know what's on your mind. I'll answer your questions at the beginning of each episode, so let it rip. Let's have some fun.